he impregnated three of his daughters and became both a father and a grandfather at the same exact time each of those babies was born. No one wants to ever utter this sentence at all due to the sickening events it takes from the moment of conception to the birth of this kind of child, but here we are with the topic at hand. Aswad Ayinde, whose birth name is Eric McGill, is an American musician and director who gained notoriety for his involvement in a series of disturbing events involving his own family. However, this is one of those cases that seemingly hides in plain sight where the truth becomes even stranger than fiction. Trigger warnings for this video include incest, abuse, forced copulation with children, and domestic violence. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Narratives. My name is Ben. On this channel we make a lot of true crime and scary stories, and if that piques your interest, please consider subscribing. Please also like this video to commemorate, remember, and support survivors of all forms of abuse, no matter what form they come in. Today we're going to uncover what years of abuse and incest can do to a family. Without further ado, let us begin. Aswad Ayinde was born on December 15, 1957, in Patterson, New Jersey. He changed his name from Eric McGill after converting to Islam. There are conflicting reports regarding his place of birth, but there is solid consensus that he did spend a significant part of his childhood in Florida and Alabama. After reciting Shahada and converting to Islam, he chose the name Aswad Ayinde. Aswad means black in Arabic, however, his new surname, Ayinde, is not of Arabic origin, but rather Nigeria's official language, Yoruba, the definition of which means, we gave praises and he came. At an early age, he showed a certain affinity for music, learning to play a plethora of instruments, and then later learning film. Later in life, he discovered the woman that he thought would become the love of his life, Beverly, and the two tied the knot in the late 1970s, putting Aswad as an early 20s bachelor when he was first married. Aswad had a very promising musical career. At one point, he actually worked with Bob Marley when he was a part of the band The Wailers and even attended the Grammy Awards shows in the 1980s. A lot of his work included songwriting and whenever he was at home, that would be exactly what he was doing in preparation for work with his next production on piano or guitar. In the year 1996, he directed an award-winning music video for the band The Fugees, whom he had directed an entire album's worth of music videos for. This was undoubtedly perhaps the crowning achievement of his career. Oswald was a very spiritual man, teaching special religious studies with his wife and children every Saturday night at home, lecturing them on what the meaning of each and every passage and verse he had read on any religious text could possibly mean. However, behind closed doors, there were much more sinister things going on with this husband and father of nine children. Parsed from interviews with his family, Aswad claimed himself to be a prophet in some deviated form of Islam or Christianity and, as such, he chose to use his newfound religion as a form to physically abuse and violate his wife and daughters, intentionally using them to birth grandchildren who were also his own children. It was reported that he had relations with five of his six daughters, but at one point an extramarital girlfriend had joined him in abusing at least one of his biological daughters. Aswad always framed the abuse as teaching their daughters to be grown women. After a while, Aswad's wife had caught on to what was going on between Aswad and his daughters, and she confronted him about it, but then faced the same belt that Aswad had used to beat his daughters. The same exact mother of all the children who were being abused did not report it to police because she was constantly afraid of the fact that perhaps one day, just one day, her husband could beat her to death or murder her in her own home. The living conditions that his wife and children lived in were deplorable to say the least, as the family at times did not have running water or a working toilet. When his first child from one of his daughters was born as a perfectly healthy baby, he had framed the situation as the will of God to justify his abuse and his acts with his children. It is said that these crimes took place over the time span of 30 years. The children were homeschooled to cut off contact with the outside world, and it is feasible that many of them did not have any actual basic documents such as social security cards or identification cards. Many of them did not even receive birth certificates until several years after they were born. 
Every time Aswa desired a sickening encounter with one of his daughters, he manipulated each of them into thinking that what he was doing with each of them was special and that they were supposed to feel special. Further, he also told them that this is how every single father treated their own daughter. The environment he had set up in his household was that of him being all-seeing and all-knowing and anyone who knew anything about one of the children or the wife doing something wrong than they were to speak to Aswa directly himself. His wife was fully aware of the crimes that Aswad was committing behind closed doors and even knew the technical term she could apply to her husband but she didn't dare say it aloud for fear of being beaten by him for the longest time. Whenever he punished any one of his children for even the slightest mishap in the household, he would tell them all to stand in a circle around the child that he was going to beat. He would particularly do this with his oldest daughter named Aziza Kibibi. The children were only allowed to watch a few cartoons on television and were not allowed to watch any TV shows that gave them an introduction to social norms, what a family is, or what a family normally does. At many times, the beatings were so severe that the children would temporarily lose the ability to breathe and the justification of these beatings were disguised further as the will of God while they simultaneously showed the power that Aswad had over his children and his household. With these kinds of atrocious activities in the family's household being considered the norm and the family being so tight-knit, the children knew no better. Further cementing this belief system, one night Aziza had been woken up as a child when her biological grandmother on her mother's side had arrived at their residence stating that Aswad was committing infidelity. Somehow, the police were called to the residence and the oldest daughter, once again Aziza, who was charged with taking care of and leading all of her other siblings, witnessed her father being able to shake hands with the police and see them laughing together at the incident that had occurred while avoiding any and all trouble with them. The key takeaway from this event as an 8 year old child is that Aziza observed that essentially her father Aswande could do no wrong and that was further proof to her of any divine power he claimed to have. And just a few weeks after this event took place, that is when the incestuous relations began between Aswande and his oldest daughter. When confronted by his wife about this, he responded by beating her just as severely as he would have beaten the children. Bizarrely enough, at one point he had purchased a ring to propose to his oldest daughter, once again Aziza, in order to keep his family isolated from the authorities and reporting what was going on behind their closed doors, Aswad did not take his family to the hospital, meaning that the first child that Aziza had birthed was born at home, was healthy, and survived. Aswad used this as justification to state that everything he was doing at home to his family was divine decree and that he could do no wrong. He further stated that he was doing what he could to keep his family's bloodline pure. From the perspective of his children, his career was becoming increasingly better, especially in the mid-90s when he began directing music videos and attending award shows. When you see a strong yet fearsome figure in your household doing unspeakable things to you and your siblings, teaching you everything that you know about the world and in return the limited view that you have of the world gives him every single reward you can imagine without any repercussions whatsoever, you might also be none the wiser than to believe everything that he says to you. And by now, without a doubt, there are many of you wondering why didn't anyone try to escape from them. The truth of the matter is there were plots to escape and even one plot to essentially murder Aswad that was concocted by the children of Aswad but these never took place due to one reason or another or an event taking place that prevented them from saving themselves from Aswad's torture. On one fateful day, however, not long after a baby boy was born by Aswad and one of his daughters, perhaps five months after the baby was born, he began to have seizures and that's when Aswad decided to send the mother of that baby, Aziza, with the baby to the hospital. When filling out hospital paperwork, since she was a minor, she had to list Aswad as her father. However, since she was also the mother of the baby, she also needed to fill out a field that asked for the name of the father of the baby, who she also listed as Aswad Ayinde. 
A social worker at the hospital pulled Aziza to the side and began asking questions and then Aziza's children were removed from her custody as well as the custody of her father. The silver lining in this situation is that the other children of Aswad who were still minors could no longer be abused. However, any of his children who were 18 or older at the time were not removed from his residence and he continued his sickening acts of lustful abuse towards his older daughters. His adult daughters rebelled as they had finally realized that they were doing nothing wrong and that their father was finally in some level of legal trouble. He went on the run, unable to live with himself or the disgraceful acts that he had performed on his own family. Aziza, along with her other sisters, gave full testimony of everything that had taken place in the home to a police detective. However, the terror didn't stop until one day in 2006. He was arrested by detectives while trying to board a plane to a different country in South America, perhaps one where he wouldn't need to face extradition. However, there is a little bit of complication in terms of timeline. There was a lengthy criminal legal process to go through with Aswande which resulted in a total sentence of 90 years in prison. An exact timeline is hard to formulate but there are reports of him trying to kidnap his children in the year 2000 outside of a public elementary school and an incident of sexual assault with him and one of his daughters in 2002 and more than I can manage to pull together here that would make sense. It is commonly reported that on July 27th of 2013, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison, adding to a 40-year sentence that he was given prior. This is, effectively speaking, a life sentence, as at the time he was sentenced, Aswad was 55 years of age. Aswande's original charges included 28 different crimes that ranged from child molestation, sexual assault, aggravated criminal sexual contact, child endangerment, and far, far more. Aziza is now a public speaker, counselor, YouTuber, author of her own book, a college graduate with two degrees, and above all else, a survivor of abuse. She runs a bakery and a nonprofit charity known as Precious Little Ladies, which is geared to helping create education and resources for little girls and fully grown women to escape their abusers. Aziza doesn't let her scars from her past weigh her down and is perhaps one of the strongest survivors of abuse anyone can imagine. In this particular case, beyond the abuse, there was loss of life that came from miscarriage as well as medical complications of birth defects that one child suffered from. If you would like to know more about everything that happened as well as support survivors of abuse, we recommend that you all visit Aziza's YouTube channel. With that, we conclude the story of Aswad Ayinde. At the end of the day, this is one of those entirely sad stories where a man takes away decades of the lives of his own children, spouses, and girlfriends and endangers them by telling them lies. One day, when I have children, this may make me stop and think about what could possibly go wrong if their playmates suddenly go missing or stop coming outside to play or if they stop going to the same school as my own children. If you want to commemorate the stories of survivors of abuse as well as making sure other people can identify these signs as well, make sure you hit the like button and if you think you'll be back, be sure to subscribe. Remember that every day is a new opportunity to see the light. Until next time, I bid you all farewell.